Thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us here this afternoon. Uh, we've got an interesting session. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, our experiences uh, running an InfoSec program at our company, at uh, Gigamon. Uh, so we're going to share a little bit about uh, some of the challenges we've had, uh, how we've worked around them, uh, what uh, solutions we've put in place to work around some of those challenges, some of the trade-offs we've had to make. Uh, but as we go through the slides, there's a couple of things I wanted to point out. Um, every company has a different set of priorities, uh, and so just because we have implemented things a certain way doesn't necessarily mean you have to do exactly the same. You have to evaluate your own uh, InfoSec requirements. You have to go through your own thought process and then perhaps take a little bit of the learnings that we've, uh, we're going to share with you today and, uh, and apply it to, to how you think about your InfoSec program. Uh, there's a couple of dimensions I'll share with you on how we've started thinking about this. Uh, the first is the notion of risk tolerance, and, and, and we'll talk a little bit about how we approached it, uh, how we split up our risk domains as well, but this is important. Uh, you have to think about what risk means to you for your companies, for your customers. So, for example, if you're in the pharmaceutical center, uh, in the pharmaceutical space, uh, intellectual property is a big deal. Uh, securing that intellectual property is a big deal, and that becomes a risk domain. Uh, if you're in transportation and logistics, or if you're in retail, uh, you know, uptime, continuous is, is a risk uh, for you, and so modeling your domains of risk is important. We'll talk to you about how we modeled our domains of risk in a little bit as well, but as I said, uh, there's no one-size-fits-all, so here's some of the things to think about as you think about your InfoSec program. There's a question over here. I'll take a couple of quick questions, and then we'll hold it till the end. Yes? No, no, no. Just a clarification. I thought I was in running a security operations center. Key challenges. This is exactly. So we're going to talk about what are the challenges we ran through in our own security operations center. The InfoSec, uh, the security operations center is part of our InfoSec program, right? Uh, I mean, it's, it's one element of an InfoSec program, and we're going to talk about that, but I wanted to preface it with saying that the trade-offs we've made, the challenges we encountered, may be a little bit different for you. Here's some of the thought processes we went through, uh, and that's how we landed up with our SOC uh, program, and then we'll talk about what we did over there. So just a little bit of a, think of it as a 10-minute caveat, but it, it's a thought process, it's a thought journey on how you think about doing this, right? The, the second thing to also think about as you think about your SOC or your InfoSec program, and the SOC is a part of that InfoSec program, is are you driven by regulation and compliance, or are you truly driven by uh, mitigating risk? Uh, and uh, regulatory and compliance is not necessarily a bad thing, but uh, mitigating risk, it takes it beyond that, right? And I can say with a fair degree of confidence that almost all the companies that got breached were compliant, right? And so uh, being overly focused on compliance is not necessarily a good thing. Having the compliance checkbox is important, but if you're really focused on mitigating risk, you have to think beyond that, and becomes a, that becomes a key part of your InfoSec program. Unfortunately, today, the majority of InfoSec programs and the SOC and everything goes to support compliance, and that's not good enough anymore. Uh, the third thing to think about, and this comes directly to running a SOC, a security operation center, is what are your capabilities? Uh, how good are you with programming? How good are you with automation? Uh, because if you are not very good, that becomes an interesting area for you to sit and think about how do you build out your SOC? How do you build out the people in your SOC? Where do you go invest? Do you insource? Do you outsource? A key part that we are facing as an industry today when we think about running InfoSec programs, running security operation centers, is a dearth of talent. Right? We have a shortage of talent, and the way you work around a little bit of that is through automation, uh, is through programming, and so thinking a little bit about this from your own SOC perspective becomes important, and building the capabilities for automation, building ca programming capabilities as part of your SOC team, I think is going to be important. Uh, and if you don't have that today, it's a dimension to think about. We thought about this as well. We invested in some of those capabilities, and my colleague Jack Ham is going to talk a little bit about that uh, uh, in a little bit over here as well. So that's another dimension for you to think about when you're thinking about your own SOC and your own InfoSec program. Uh, and so as we kick off the session talking about what we've done for our security operations center, uh, what I would like you to take back from this is that your requirements, your risk profile, your capabilities may be different. And it is important to think about that first before you go jump headlong into going and developing uh, a security operations center and, and making that part of your bigger InfoSec program. Okay, so with that, uh, let me quickly jump off into how we started modeling the domains of risk within Gigamon. So we uh, uh, provide a platform for network security, 
uh, 80 of the Fortune 100 companies leverage Gigamon, and they plug a lot of their network security solutions behind Gigamon. And so when we started do modeling the domains of risk and when we put our own SOC in place and our own infosec program in place, we broke our domains of risk into three pieces. And the first one was our customers, right? The people who use Gigamon. And we wanted to make sure that our products are secure so that when our customers go deploy Gigamon, uh, whatever they plug into a Gigamon, whether it is an APT solution, whether it is an uh, uh, IPS solution, whether it is a firewall solution, the Gigamon product itself doesn't lead to the customers getting compromised. And that became part of our InfoSec program, doing things like pen testing and other capabilities as well. That was one, one big domain of risk that we wanted to go make sure that we are covering as well. Again, your domains of risk may be different, but this is how we thought about it. Uh, the second part was our core, which is that, okay, as we are a product, as we are a technology-oriented company, where is our product development happening? Where is our source code happening? Who has access to that? What routers, what firewalls does that sit behind? How do we protect that? Because that's a key part of our risk domain as well. And so that became a second domain of risk that we wanted to protect, and that became part of our InfoSec program and part of our security operations center practice to be able to monitor and model the risk to those particular domains as well. And then the third one, of course, is the rest of the corporate. Right? Everybody has laptops, everybody has desktops, there are handheld devices, and that is the biggest threat vector. That's the initial threat vector for almost all threats coming in. The human element is the most easy element to compromise today, and so that's the third area of domain of risk that we wanted to go uh, make sure that our security operations center and our InfoSec program models around. And based on that, we created a risk registry that captured the risks in every one of these domains, and we started tracking that on a pretty uh, regular basis. So that's how we started thinking about our own InfoSec program, which is the biggest impact is our customers. We want to make sure our customers are secure. The second thing is our core. Where are we building our IP? Where is our source code? Where is our technology being developed and protecting that? And then the rest of the corporate uh, environment as well. Now, when we started looking at our own security landscape and our own company landscape, we're not a large company. We're about 700, 800 employees. Uh, uh, but we do have many of the characteristics of larger companies. So we started as a small company in, in a location in Milpitas. We grew. We bought a bigger building. Uh, we added an offshore development center, a center of excellence, where we had a lot of our R&D people in another country, in another site as well. Uh, we started adding sales offices globally in different parts of the world. Uh, we added support centers in different parts of the world. Uh, we added some cloud operations as well. And with that, our threat landscape changed. Now the boundaries have dissolved between what is internal versus external, uh, what is secure versus insecure. There's no such boundary anymore because we are a globally a distributed organization, on-prem solutions, cloud solutions as well. And so from that perspective, our environment became pretty complex. Even though we are not a massive company, our environment to protect and our domain to protect became pretty complex. And uh, we went through a little bit of a thought exercise thinking, okay, how should we think about simplifying this because we don't have the resources to go protect everything? And what should be the initial areas of focus? What should be the secondary areas of focus? And one of the things we uh, modeled around was that one of the areas that we feel strongly about from an InfoSec and from a security operations center perspective is to be able to leverage the network, not just as a medium of connectivity, but as a medium of telemetry and as a medium of detection. And so for us, the network became the primary area of focus to go after when, it, when we talk about our security operations center and looking inside the network both as a way for detecting uh, threats as well as as a way for enforcing certain policy actions as well. And so that's how we said, okay, let's make that the primary area of focus. Endpoint is also important. It doesn't go away. We still have endpoint-based solutions, but the thrust became let's, looking, let's look into the network environment because the endpoint, no matter how much you do on the endpoint perspective, no matter how many solutions you put on the endpoint, again, the human element is such that the endpoint becomes the easiest element to compromise. Right? So we put a lot of focus around the network and tried to approach it from a network perspective. And when we did that, we realized we had some challenges. We had some problems. Like many of you over here, we deployed uh, intrusion prevention systems. We deployed firewalls. We have SIMs that are looking at network traffic data as well. And what we realized is that the volume of network traffic data is massive. It's huge. Uh, and that was leading to a significant challenge in terms of the cost of running our SOC and all the tools we're deploying in our SOC, as well as how many people you need 
to go be able to look at all the information that uh, these tools are putting out out there as well. So this became a real challenge, saying, okay, we're going to focus on the network, uh, but all the network security tools are significantly challenged because of the massive volumes of traffic. And the second problem we ran into is that a lot of our traffic is also encrypted. Right? We are a cloud-first company, which means that not necessarily means put everything in AWS and Azure. What it means is we will leverage SaaS applications as much as we can. What cannot be satisfied with SaaS, uh, we will then go look to see if we can put it in AWS, Azure, and if not, we'll put it in our data center as well. But we start with a cloud-first approach as well. And in a cloud-first approach, a lot of the traffic is encrypted as well. So we started having this challenge where a lot of our tooling in our SOC was challenged by the sheer volume of data and the fact that when you start thinking about doing things like decryption or looking at encrypted traffic, uh, the utilization falls significantly. Now, the easy way to solve that is throw more tooling. Right? But that's an expensive solution, and we have limited budgets. Again, as I said, we're not a large company. Even larger companies are limited amount in the budgets that they have to deal with. So this became a little bit of a challenge for us, and so we backed off a little bit and said, is there a more architecturally sound approach to dealing with this? Right? And this problem arises, by the way, because most companies, and in, including us when we started doing this, would do this. We have a network infrastructure, and we would throw tools at the problem, and we would connect tools at different parts of the network, hoping that we would see the right traffic and catch the right kinds of uh, malware movement, lateral movement, north-south movement, com command and control. We were hoping that that would be the case, but hope is not a strategy, right? And so this kind of an approach, this kind of an ad hoc approach, is what led to all of those challenges. Right? And I would encourage other people, if you are thinking about leveraging network telemetry data for InfoSec, to move away from this. What we did was we took a platform-based approach, an architectural approach, where we actually deployed a security delivery platform. And the platform actually connects into the network. Uh, and it connects into the network across physical, virtual, and cloud. So instead of your tools reaching out into specific portions of your network, the platform collects all the traffic from the different parts of the network and brings it to the tool. It's a paradigm shift, right? And it took a little bit of time to go deploy all of this and figure out where all in the network we want the data from, where all are we going to tap into the network, and then take that data and then feed it to the tools. And once we took this approach, there were several benefits that came about. Uh, and we're going to walk through this. I'm going to have Jack come and talk a little bit about some of this in a bit as well. The first part is that the platform got us the capability to get access to data and traffic and telemetry information across your physical, your virtual, and your cloud infrastructures. So no matter where our applications are today or where they're going to be in the future, we knew we had access to the right telemetry data that we needed for running our SOC and for our eyes on the wall. Right? So the platform provided us access to physical uh, network traffic data because we use physical taps. It provided us uh, access to traffic data in a private cloud environment because the platform integrated with a VMware environment. And it provides us access to network uh, traffic and telemetry in an AWS and Azure world as well. So we've got coverage. That was the first step. We took care of the coverage problem as well. And um, let me, at this point, bring Jack on to talk a little bit about some of his experiences in dealing with this as well. Jack, by the uh, I, I'm the CTO. Jack is the guy who actually makes things happen. He runs, actually runs our uh, security operations center and our InfoSec program. Right, which means he just told you all the uh, philosophy and then said, go build that. Um, everyone having a good conference? Yeah? Did anyone else get a bottle of hangover recovery drink hanging on their doorknob last night? Yeah? Okay, a few people? Good. Wasn't just me. Um, yeah, so when I was brought into Gigamon, I was uh, given the task of, okay, you're going to build a sock now. Go. And one of the very first things I noticed, and to Shazad's point about ad hoc deployment, for example, is that we did have tools. We had a lot of good tools. We had spent a lot of money. Um, but when you started to look at it, the relevance of the relevant traffic getting to them wasn't there because what happens is, well, we buy an IDS and we go, uh, let's put a span tap over here. Maybe that span port will get the data. Oh, but that's the core switch. It starts getting overloaded. It's not seeing the traffic. And so one of the things that Gigamon has done well is that they've got the security delivery platform. So functionally for us, um, one of these things is an appliance, right? And so what we did is we took the appliance and we plugged it into the network and we stuck it between our core and our firewalls. And then we did some intelligent tapping of uh, fiber elsewhere in the network 
And all of a sudden, I had this ability to start sending all of the traffic that I needed to the tools in one spot. And out of that came some other things that were really useful. For example, we started being able to deduplicate packets. Um, this became enormous because when we first started tapping and we said, okay, now we're going to go over here and put it to this, this IDS, for example, um, it was seeing the same traffic from multiple segments. And so this became very problematic for us because now we've got the tool that's getting the traffic, but now it's getting multiple copies of the traffic. So now it's starting to gurgle blood again, and uh, my team is blind because it's getting duplicate alerts for these same flows in multiple locations. So once we got into that model, we started saying that, okay, now we can do this. Let's build an infrastructure out so that when we want to add tools, it's plug and play. So I would say when we started, a new tool was, uh, I don't know, a three-week endeavor to get it going, and especially if we wanted to just do a POC, it was a lot of labor. We had a lot of, a lot of problems with that. But once we built this fundamental framework, we got to the point now where we can just plug a tool in, and it's just another port next to another tool, and it's getting all the traffic. Um, we have now moved uh, POCs, appliance-based POCs, from a few weeks of setup down to about two hours on average for us to get them going. And so as a result of that, I've, uh, one of the things we started doing in our own SOC was we said, hey, there's a lot of tools out there. What are the good ones? Well, in the old days, you go to sales, and salespeople lie to you and tell you things that they think you want to hear, and you ignore them and go back to work, and you're still not sure which tool to buy. Um, so we actually implemented a program now where we roll, on average, we aim for three tools per quarter. Um, and now for perspective, my team is three people. We have three security people, including me. Um, we're now able to pump through POCs at a rate of about one a month all year long. And then out of that, we make decisions on which tools perform better, which, which tools perform best, which tools were most relevant to our network. Um, we're an R&D shop, right? Um, there are tools that I think would probably perform wonderfully in retail, but when you plug them into a network with a bunch of engineers, uh, alarms start going off all over the place. You know, reverse SSH is scary. Why is this person making DNS? request this way. That looks like DNS tunneling. And so as a result of that, we started to be able to refine our tooling approach. Um, then we got to the point of virtual, and we said, okay, now we've got the physical network looking good, but what about lateral movement? And what kind of kicked us into gear with this was WannaCry originally. And we said, okay, well, our entire domain controller network is virtualized. Uh, we don't see what's happening on the vSwitch. Um, so we deployed virtual agents. And so now we've got the ability, in addition to the physical network, to see east-west traffic contained within our vSwitch. And then the mandate came down from the top that we're going to the cloud. We're now cloud forward, is that what you said? Okay. Cloud first. That's what he told me, cloud first. First. So then we went to the cloud, and then I said, oh, great, now i got to monitor things in the cloud. And we did the same thing. And the important thing for my team is being so small is that I'm able to see everything, and I'm able to see it in one sock. And like I said, we've got three people, and we're eight by five. Um, yeah, we get paged at 3 a.m. in the morning occasionally because something blows up and we need to go look at it, but it allows me to operate this very trim knock so I'm not constantly trying to scale out analysts, and instead I can smartly scale out my tooling and build alarming that way. Um, and so that's kind of how we started to approach it. And uh, from an infrastructure standpoint, this is what we built now, and this is what we're running in-house. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you for sharing that insight. So this was the basis of, of our InfoSec program and setting up our SOC. Uh, the next challenge that we ran into is, okay, now we have coverage, right? And in the future, if we have applications moving between a physical and a virtual and a cloud infrastructure, we're not worried about that because the platform takes care of all of that. The second thing is, uh, okay, uh, now that we're a cloud-first company, as I mentioned, a lot of our traffic uh, is, is, is going out to the cloud and it's encrypted. And the question is, are we blind to that? And how do you deal with that? So that's the second piece that our our platform provides us a capability, which is it allows us to go look at selective elements of traffic, decrypt those traffic, not everything, and the platform actually has a very sophisticated categorization engine. So you can say these categories of traffic, please decrypt it, and these categories of traffic don't decrypt. And I'll talk a little bit about what we do with not decrypted traffic in a little bit as well. But the platform gave us that capability to discern what kinds of traffic we want to go inspect and, and decrypt, and then go send off to the tools. So the tools don't have to deal with decryption. Decryption is a pretty computationally intensive process. Typically, it takes 60 70% utilization goes down on the tools, and you have to repeat this in every tool, which means you're taking the hit in every tool that actually needs to look at plain text traffic, rather than that, we said, okay, architecturally, it's more sound to do it in one place, do it in the platform, and everybody else gets the benefit of it. The tools get the full utilization. You're doing it once. It just makes sense. Now, there were some policy considerations and some things that we had run through, and I'll turn it over to Jack to walk through some of those implementation challenges and, and issues that we, we ran through as well. Yeah, so as a security person, you can imagine I was very excited when we were told to go do this. Um, this is a tricky one. So uh, there's going to be people in here in 
different sectors as we're talking about when we say you need to really think about what your tolerance is, what your goals are. Um, I have a lot of engineers that are around us. You know, we're doing R&D. Telling them we're about to start decrypting their traffic didn't necessarily go over great. Um, but from the security standpoint, as more and more traffic moves to encryption and as we see more and more malware being, being encrypted natively, uh, this became a real problem. You know, one of the ways that we think about it internally is that our overall protection of our network winds up being effectively a function of how quickly we can detect and how quickly we can respond. And one of the ways I end up thinking about this is that if you have infinity in there, you've got a problem. And so, you know, we say internally in our SOC that infinity is the enemy of security. Um, and so we had to do this. Like, this was no choice in this. Um, however, the policy side of it becomes a little tricky, and I'll encourage you if you start to move down the world of decrypting SSL, uh, talk to your lawyers early because they're going to have a lot to say about this, um, as will your compliance people. Um, but I think the way you have to approach it and the way we approached it is to look at really where were we going. So one of the things that we wanted to do is we clearly wanted to watch things that are obviously concerning. Um, you know, yes, do we block things like pornography sites at the edge, yes. Do we block things like dark web traffic, Tor, yes. But uh, east-west movement, even internally, that's still encrypted, can tell you something about a story that's developing on your network, even if it has not l yet left your network. Uh, so we started with kind of a very narrow range of categories that generally seemed unconcerning to people, and we circulated them around and got some feedback to see if people were going to be worried about these things, and they weren't. Um, and then we moved out from there, and we started asking questions like, is it okay for us to decrypt iCloud, for example, knowing that some of our employees run their personal iCloud on their laptops? Um, we decided no. We decided that wasn't going to be okay. However, we did decide to go with OneDrive. Uh, we run it internally. We thought there's some value there in case anyone's try and in case anyone's putting any malware or code out on the OneDrive. So we did go with that route. Um, and eventually, after a while, we kind of iterated through and found up a list that we could do. And then the next immediate challenge happened is we said, okay, now we're going to roll this out in, in an offshore site we have. And then the lawyers raised their hand and said, uh, different compliance schemas, different regulatory rules. And then we had to do the whole exercise again. Um, what I will say, though, is once it was done and once we were intelligently doing the decryption, uh, the tool use obviously went up. It saw more traffic. When it was just seeing SSL sessions, it couldn't do anything. So what's it do? It does some basic threat intel matching, pops it up against, you know, source and desk IP, and you hope for the best. Uh, maybe it's doing a little bit around SSL cert inspection, but that's it. As soon as we, as soon as we opened up decryption, guess what? We started finding malware. We started finding problems. Um, so every one of you is going to have to go back if you want to think about doing decryption and ask what is the tolerance you're going to take? What are the categories you're willing to decrypt? Um, I suspect no one is going to decrypt everything. I think everyone's going to go through that list and go, we're not going to do that one. Um, and, but do it, because you will get better tool performance out of this, and you will get results, and you will see what you need to find in there. And I guarantee you, as soon as you start decrypting, you're going to find bad stuff in, the, uh, in those packets. Great. Thanks uh, for that insight as well. So, um, a, and this is, this is a big item, right, which is if you are going down this path, as, as Jack mentioned, I do want to emphasize, make sure you talk to your in-house general counsel because the policy implications of this are important. Uh, but uh, the end goal was actually very good. The end result for us was actually very good in going down this uh, trajectory as well. So, okay, so we got the coverage. Uh, we took care of our encrypted traffic and figuring out from a policy perspective, categorization perspective, what traffic we want to inspect, what traffic we don't want to inspect. But the third thing was, okay, now we've got a lot of data to go deal with. Uh, how do we whittle this down a little bit, right? How do we reduce the amount of information we have to go deal with? And, and that's where the platform provided us the ability to look at metadata. Uh, and metadata is really important from a, networking from a network telemetry perspective because looking at all sessions of network traffic is just too much information to go through. So network metadata provide, provides a really good shorthand. I mean, the way I talk about it is, uh, you know, a network tap is like a phone tap. Uh, network metadata is like a phone bill. And there's a lot of information you get from a phone bill, and, and that's one of the things we did, right? So we, like many of you, we have SIMs that we have deployed internally, and uh, the SIMs were getting a bunch of feeds from a variety of different solutions, you know, log, uh, logs from domain controllers, from firewalls, from endpoints. One of the challenges around relying on logs exclusively is that many times what happens is logs are generated by the CPU on the devices, and so you turn on logging uh, on your domain controller or on your firewall, and the performance 
mistakes and impact, the higher the logging, the more the performance impact. And suddenly, somebody on the networking team will come and turn the logging off because it's impacting the performance. Security team doesn't know about it. Three months later, there's an incident. You go down to your SIM. You try to figure out what's actually going on, and you're missing the logs. Right? And, and now you're blind to a little, little bit of this. And so this is a little bit of a challenge, and, and we, we saw this early on as well. And so we said, okay, let's, let's figure out a way where we can reliably get equivalent information, uh, reliably get equivalent information with no impact to all of the devices. And so the platform actually provided us an ability to generate network metadata. Initially, this took the form of NetFlow uh, and, and IP fix, but eventually uh, there was a lot more uh, enriched metadata uh, that the platform started generating, which we then took and started feeding into our SIM, and that actually provide a significant relief in terms of not just the amount of data and the amount of logs that to consume in the SIM, but in terms of the reliability and efficacy of that information as well. So, uh, Jack, do you want to share with us a little bit about what are some of the metadata elements that we were looking at in our uh, SOC? Sure. Um, so this, this is perhaps my favorite one. I think this is, um, of all the things we've managed to do internally that have, have streamlined our operations and have had allow, allowed us to be really effective, it's the network metadata. Um, Shazad had mentioned this earlier, but I think it's worth, worth actually reiterating, is that we view the network as the source of truth. Um, what happens on the network actually happens. So if we can observe it and we can make action against that, then we've got this huge leading edge indicator. We still are collecting logs, um, you know, which depending on which platform you're collecting them into can be expensive. So we've been able to turn down some of our logging because of this. But the reason is, is that this is being popped off the wire right as the packet goes by, and then it's being ingested. So amongst the things we're collecting right now is we're collecting DNS, um, we're collecting HTTP information, and we're collecting SSL right now. We started with DNS because of the fact that we kind of view it as the foundational thing. Not a lot happens without DNS. Um, and so we have a ton of elements that we're able to export, and we eventually, over some experimentation, whittled them down uh, to basically return codes, query uh, R codes, op codes, things like that. Um, and then we collect them into our sim. And from there, we just we had a pile of DNS metadata, and then we were, said, okay, now what do we do? Um, so we started looking at what the models looked like, and, and a lot of this was experimentation. And we were fortunate; and I'm fortunate to have a bunch of very good engineers under me. That two of them, but they're uh, they're wonderful, and they're uh, they're very smart, and so they're able to think through this as a as kind of a holistic problem. And one of the things we started to realize, and, and we sort of said this before, that you know, security is going to be done differently everywhere. And, and the other thing side of that is when you're watching your network, everyone's network is going to behave a little differently. And it turns out, as you start to build this long-term model and look at the data, you start to realize that certain things about your network end up being true. You see certain spikes. You see certain patterns when you're looking at time series data. You see certain blends of response codes. We don't uh, run IPv6 internally. So we see very few quad A records running across the network. Um, so a few, few months ago, we suddenly saw a lot of quad A records. And we said, oh, no, <laughs> that's that. We aren't running IPv6. Well, as it turns out, there was a, an engineer running a traffic generator, and he was doing some IPv6 simulation. Um, and we were able to identify that. But the point of that is, though, is that this is a leading-edge indicator that allowed us to look at something and go, that is different. And I use metadata, and the way we use it internally is to point us to things. Because there's lots of stuff to look at, and we're all doing hunting, and we're all going through the network trying to understand, is this bad, is this good? Um, I'm going to make you participate now. Show of hands. Anyone have too many alerts? Yeah? Uh, yeah, right? Um, well, and that's a real problem, right? And we all have that problem. Um, this gives us a way to start to lower that threshold because we can start saying, you know, we've got some alerts over here, but this thing is actually behaviorally different. And so by doing that, we can start to pivot and say, let's look in that direction for a little while rather than the normal strategy of, okay, we've got 10 alerts now. Uh, we've only got enough resources to do these two. So let's drop those eight and hope the bad thing wasn't in those eight. Um, and that is unfortunately for us not a way to do security. Uh, so as we started to do this, we learned about our DNS. And then a lot of interesting things came out of this. So one is we started saying, well, DGA domain generation algorithm, DGAs are a problem. And we said, you know, now we've got the query information. It's low volume. We know exactly what was requested. Why don't we just write a, an entropy checker? So we wrote a Shannon entropy checker. And so now we have a Shannon entropy checker. And every time there is a query observed on our network, 100% of the traffic, it goes against that entropy checker. And if the entropy checker 
exceeds a certain Shannon entropy threshold, we get told about it. And then over time, what you are able to do is you start to look at the network and say, okay, well, certain things look bad, for example, when you're checking entropy, but they turn out to be okay. Uh, what's a good example of this? An AWS domain, it has high entropy, it's not human readable, it's long, um, but it's not necessarily bad. So we can start saying, oh, well, actually, that's our AWS account. Let's not watch that, anyone. We have a we have a travel internal travel agency that for uh, that does you know booking for trips and stuff that for some weird reason packages a hash in a URL. Um, so there's a DNS query of this long you know looks like a maybe an MD5 or something or some sort of UUID. So every time that hits up against the entropy generator, oh that's a problem. Okay, well it's our travel agency. We'll leave that. And then slowly over time you start to develop this list because you start to percolate up all the things that don't match understood network behavior, and then you wind up with some things to look at, and there's a lot less of them. So we did that with DNS. We, we started profiling how our network normally behaves, what servers there are. We started to say, hey, you know, we're going to start bringing more and more DNS in-house. We don't want people going out to the internet for resolving stuff. Now, all of a sudden, we've got the ability to watch for rogue DNS servers. Why? Because we can say these ones are the trusted ones, and if you're not on that list, tell us because we want to know why you're going out there. From there, we moved into SSL. Um, SSL certs turn out to be a massively valuable piece of information. Uh, one of the things that we very early did, and we're still working through this process because it turns out it's really hard, um, when users go to websites that have bad certs, we tell them don't click continue. They get the red alert, alert, alert in Chrome, and we tell them don't continue. And then our engineers go to our Git server, and it's got a bad cert. And then we say, that's okay, that's ours, go ahead. Um, it is trivial if you're connect, collect, collecting SSL metadata to just look for the case where the signer and the subject are the same. And now all of a sudden you've got a hit list of self-signed certs inside your network and you can start looking at them. Um, we also did SSL negotiation on non-standard ports and, and this one, the very first moment we hit run on the report, um, the very first thing I see is an SSL negotiation on like 38,001, it's going to a Comcast address, the cert's signed by Plex Media Server, and I'm like, oh God. I'm like, that's it, data exfiltration, someone's offloading. So we go trace it down, the team's running around, we find the engineer, it's an engineer that happens to like watch Game of Thrones in the office, so he was streaming from home. Um, but from the standpoint of reducing the problem set, that is now a known quantity that we can now ignore in the future. And again, we start to get this percolation. And so we've done this over and over. When the woe sign thing happened a few, what, about a year ago now, um, we said, you know, just for the time being, let's add woe sign to a list of certs we don't trust. So what we did is we went and we found every single cert that had trans, trans uh, across the network in about a month. Um, and we basically sat down and went through the list and we found all the CAs that we trusted. And then we found some CAs that we're like, maybe we don't trust those ones, we put WoSign over there, and now anytime there's a certain negotiation against WoSign on our network, we can go see, is there something concerning there, or is it just that there's an engineer reading a newspaper back in China? Um, and oftentimes that's the case, but again, it starts to cut our problem set up and reduce it so we have less places to look, and it's really fast. Um, and then when the logging, if we need to, we can write searches that then correlate against the logging, which is also enormously helpful because you can then say, this happened on the network, did this event also was it observed in the logs? And then out of this, you just start to build all these different models that allow you to rapidly hunt through the network. Cool. All right. So, uh, Mike, please. Uh, so that, again, there's a lot more information that we can go through, but in the interest of time, we'll run through a couple of these things quickly. The key over here is that, again, stepping back, right, by, by taking an architectural approach, by putting the platform in, this all became possible. We could do the SSL decryption. We could do the categorization. We had visibility, physical, virtual cloud. And now we had the ability to do metadata extraction to be able to quickly zone in on specific areas of interest that we wanted to go look at as well. Uh, the, the other one or two interesting things that the platform afforded us the capability was this notion of targeted inspection. Certain security solutions, certain network-based security solutions want to go look at full package streams of data. Uh, but uh, uh, those, those package streams of data, some of it is relevant and some of it is not relevant. For example, uh, in many cases, many of these solutions, you know, if, if you're running some streaming media, if you're going to YouTube, uh, many of these tools will simply discard that traffic, right? Or Netflix or Hulu as an example. But at the same time, when you're tapping into the network and sending in a whole pipe, uh, the tools are busy doing all of this stuff. They're looking at this 
this and saying, okay, this is irrelevant, let me drop it. So we leveraged the platform to do that pre-filtering, right? And, and, and using the platform, what we could actually do is we could make sure that certain applications that were not relevant or that didn't need inspection could be discarded, and other applications that were important from an inspection perspective actually made it to the security tools. Um, and, and you can do this for a variety of targeted applications. You know, you can do this, for example, uh, you know, Windows will pump out updates every so often, and on those particular dates, you can say, I want to exclude all of the Windows updates from going to my tools, because that's simply going to hammer them, right? And it's going to take the performance down significantly. And so we could leverage the platform to do this kind of targeted inspection uh, at an application level and make sure that the right sets of application traffic uh, were hitting the tools all the way from the start, uh, from the first packet from the TCP SYN all the way till when the session completed. That entire session was either filtered into the tool so it could do the inspection or taken out so that the tools are not overburdened and you're getting more uh, in terms of the performance of the tools. So your investment, your investment dollars are going a lot further as well. Right? So that was another key piece of the platform that we uh, took advantage of. There's one last piece that I'm going to talk about. There's a lot more, but uh, this is another very interesting piece, and then we'll kind of open it up to uh, uh, questions, and, and Jack will talk a little bit about this as well, is that many security solutions today are deployed in line, right? Firewalls are in line. They'll sit and block and take action on the traffic. IPSs are in line. Web application firewalls are in line to the network. Um, and uh, many of you who are uh, who've come from a networking background, you know that networking infrastructure is constantly changing. You'll go through an upgrade cycle. And when you tend to connect some of these solutions in line to your network, what happens is that a network infrastructure refresh can potentially force and rip and replace because now you've gone from one gig network link to a 10 gig network link. You've connected an IPS directly in the, in the network. You've got to go throw that blade out or throw the IPS out and get a 10 gig IPS. Even though you may not have 10 gig of network traffic going on, you may actually have a smaller amount of traffic going on. And you can't connect them serially either because you're still down to the lowest common denominator. So you can't take three or four one gig IPSs and connect them into the link because they're still down to one gig. It's, it's a serial connection fundamentally. So, so that becomes a challenge for deploying inline solutions. The other problem we also had is the, the networking team is a little bit loath to putting things in line, right? You want to try out a new solution, you want to try out an APT solution, and you say, go put this in line, and they're going to say, I'm going to break my network. I'm not going to put it in line. Sorry, guys. My job as a networking guy is to ensure connectivity. Uh, it's not to break connectivity. And so there's a little bit of this uh, uh, tussle going on between the networking and security operations team. And so many times what happens is you'll deploy a, an inline solution, perhaps in a monitor mode or in an out-of-band mode, and, and once you get comfortable with the position, with the capability of the tool, or the policies, what kinds of traffic you want to take action on, what traffic you don't want to take action on. Once you've built out that policy model or that comfort zone, you'll flip it and bring it in line. But in order to do that, you now you've got to go schedule a maintenance window, right? Because you've got to take the network down, you've got to go connect it in line. And so that, again, leads to a lot of challenges operationally. And so the platform actually has a really neat capability where you can connect the platform in line. Okay, you do it once, the platform's connected, 1 gig, 10 gig, 40 gig, 100 gig, 25 gig, it doesn't matter. You connect the platform and at whatever speeds you want, and then all the traffic that you want to send to your inline tools, whether it's to an IPS or to a WAF, the platform will divert it, but now it can actually load balance inline. Right? So if you have a set of 1 gig IPSs and you've got a 10 gig link or a 40 gig link, you can add more of those 1 gig IPSs in line to the network and it will load balance across the traffic. And if any one of those devices fails, it will bypass it. So your network stays up if that's the policy or it will drop it depending on whatever policy you choose. And so this became a really nice way for us to go deploy inline solutions or real-time threat prevention solutions. But also, uh, in terms of building up that comfort zone, let me go deploy this outer band, see if it works, doesn't work. The platform is connected in line to the network. You can connect your security solutions out of band. And when you're ready to bring them in line, you flip a switch on the platform, you don't have to touch the network, and it is automatically brought in, in line. Right? So you don't have to go schedule maintenance windows. You don't have to have this network security team headbutting. Uh, and, and all of this kind of kind of works pretty uh, uh, smoothly as well. Jack, do you want to share some insights on that as well? Yeah, sure. Um... So, so if there's any headbutting between network and security at Gigamon, it's me headbutting myself because I own both teams. Um, but the uh, the inline solution is is interesting. Uh from an operational standpoint for my team because I, I don't want to hear from executives that the network is down because um, I don't want them calling me. Um, so 
what this has given us, uh, not just from a POCing standpoint, but we're able to bring tools in, we're able to pull them out if they're having problems, but also from a failure standpoint, if we have something that's in line that's important in IPS, for example, and it does happen to die, um, we don't go and host the whole network, uh, which, you know, I don't, are there any networking specific people in here or network security people? No? Okay. The, um, if, you're, if you're on the hook for the other side of this, the, the availability in the CIA triad, then, uh, you know, you have to worry about this. Um, a security tool that causes us not to be able to do business for 30 minutes, um, I haven't done my job right. So this has allowed us to scale this out and then also self-heal really quickly if we have any of these kind of problems. Um, do you lose some visibility during that standpoint? Yes. Um, it's a balancing act, I think, for us. Um, are we willing to lose some visibility if it means that we haven't taken the entire headquarters office down? Yeah, that's something I'm willing to deal with. We can go on high alert during the period that the tool's down and get it running again. Um, and also then there's the scalability thing. Sh Shazad alluded to this, but the one of the things I'm starting to look for as we go into the you know next few years is where's our bandwidth going to be going? Um, I've got tools. Um, I don't necessarily want to upgrade them all. Not all of them even have in their roadmap for example, 40 gig links. Um, so now I have the ability with 40 gig traffic to slave it out amongst several 10 gig tools. So if I have to go and I don't have a vendor that's ready to go the other way, I can go horizontally. Um, we've also done this for license cost constraint. We're working on this project right now, actually, um, where there was a, a certain tool that the licensing was modeled against the backplane throughput. And I said, you know, that doesn't make any sense because I don't have the backplane throughput. You're charging me based on the size of the device. And I said, you know, what I could do <laughs> is buy a small device maybe even buy two small devices because the licensing is tied to the device size and put them parallel in line. And now I'm paying for smaller devices that's not an HA pair. If I lose one of them, I've still got the other one running. Um, and I think on that one we're going to get something like 70, 75 percent cost savings, um, which is huge because um, this guy doesn't give me all the budget I want. So you can tell him to give me more. Well. Any more budget that you're going to get <laughs> is not going to go towards manpower. It's going to go towards automation. That's right. Okay. And so that's the last piece that I want to talk about. This is this is a topic that's actually near and dear to both Jack and me. Uh, many of us recognize over here that uh, security personnel shortage is a real issue. And you're not going to be able to scale your SOC just focused on hiring more people to do it. Automation is a key piece of that whole piece. Uh, the cloud folks have got this right, by the way. Right? DevOps has actually got this right. They've done a good job with many of the tools available for DevOps, and it is time for Sec DevOps. Right? It is time to bring those that mindset and that mentality into running a security operations uh, center as well. So let, let me hand this over to Jack, because Jack has done a good job. Jack came from a DevOps perspective. He's come from an automation perspective, and he brought a lot of that perspective into running our own security operations center. So Jack, you want to talk a little bit about what you've done with automation and APIs? Yeah, I'll give you, um, th there's one POC we've done that I, I think is really, uh, it's, it's kind of our first real strong foray into it, and it's really, uh, it's a great example of it is at one point in time I was asked to look at full PCAP solutions and, and the problem with full PCAP solutions if you've ever done them is that they're either incredibly expensive or what you can afford means that you have a really short window of retention and then we know that the dwell time of, of most incidents is fairly long. So you're collecting traffic but chances are by the time you know what you need uh, it's already been rolled off the back end of the PCAP collector. Uh, and then when I looked at the pricing, I was like, I'm just not going to do it. But I said, there's got to be another way. And again, when I talked about targeting in on things that we want to see, I started to say, like, look, would it be great to collect every bit of traffic on the network? Sure. But not every bit of traffic is, is, is equal. Um, there are certain things that are starting to behave strange that are looking weird. And so what we did is we started to take all of our tools that are able to tell us that this is suspicious, that's a known threat, that's a virus. and we pulled all those alerts together and we ran them into the sim and we wrote rules. And what we ended up building was on the other end of this was a, a Moloch, it's a open source uh, PCAP, distributed PCAP collector. And we said, okay, if we see enough of alert threshold for a certain IP, let's route that into the security delivery platform and only collect the packets from that IP and send it into the PCAP collector. Um, now, 
sure, is there a chance you're going to miss something? Yeah, but if you have no PCAP collection opportunity or you have targeted, I argue that the targeted goes better. And in this particular case, this tool just runs and it runs and it finds suspicious things. And we go in, my engineers go in, we do, we review them, we go do incident response, then we take the rule back out. Um, but the thing is just doing this on its own. It's automated. Um, we can come in in the morning and there's, oh, there's a new IP in there and we're just rolling PCAPs. Um, you know, we're down from what would normally be something like, you know, five or seven gig of traffic. Um, you know, we're, co we're collecting hundreds of megs of traffic. We were able to just do this on a single x80 reg regular one U server with, you know, a terabyte hard drive space or something. So a solution that probably would have cost us a half million dollars if we tried to do full PCAP and then likely wouldn't have worked, um, I don't know, it cost 20 grand. I mean, it was nothing. It was just basically some labor of putting the APIs together and doing some automation. And now once we got that working and we saw that going, we're like, okay, we're clearly going to keep going down this route. And eventually we're going to start doing inline blocking. Because, hey, you can wait for the firewall to do it, or you can try to shorten that distance as that blast radius is expanding and just kill it right in the middle of the network, which is something we'll be able to do. Because just like we can route traffic intelligently on our security delivery platform, we can also just black hole that traffic and stop it where it is. So now all of a sudden we've got the ability to just start self-resolving events, and it gives our team time to get, catch up with them, which is, you know, an obvious problem. You know, we saw the show of hands for alerts, like it takes time to get there. So if we can contain it now, then great. Cool. Thanks. So uh, obviously there's a lot more that goes on in running a security operations center, but we wanted to provide some insights on, you know, some of the decision process and some of the thought process that led to some decisions we've taken. The end goal was actually very good for us, is very good for us. You remember the picture I showed earlier where we landed up with uh, security tools not really effectively utilized. You know, they're running to the full capacity, but they're doing things that are not really relevant to them. Ultimately, we landed up with a situation where we have fewer tools, uh, but they're very well utilized. The entire cost of running our security operations center drops significantly. We are very efficient. There's three people, including Jack, running all of the stuff. Uh, but also the fact that we have the expertise, we have the automation, the programming expertise in the SOC makes a big difference in making all of this happen as well. So I'll end with uh, this last slide coming back to this. This is how we did some of these things in our SOC. Uh, your risk tolerance may be different. You may be looking at different risk vectors. So start with that. Start with what are the areas in which you would categorize your domains of risk. Uh, understand whether you're going to be focused primarily on regulation and compliance or you're going to be focused on mitigation of risk, right? Because regulation and compliance is fine, but as I mentioned, almost all the companies that got breached were compliant. So start thinking beyond compliance and start thinking about your own InfoSec program and your SOC as, as going beyond the whole regulation piece of it. Focus on, on the technology piece. How good are you at technology? How good are, are you at automation, at programming? We made an, an investment when we hired the two people in our SOC team. The focus was on bringing people who could do automation, who could write scripts, who could do programming. That was a critical part of, of being able to streamline our security operations center, reduce the cost of all of that stuff. It was a decision we made. You may do things differently, but this is how we thought about the whole thing. And then what are the domains in which we thought you know, uh, we, uh, we had threats for us, you know, our customers, our products, where we develop our source code, develop our technology, putting uh, frameworks to make sure that we're looking at all the traffic in and out of those particular domains of threat. And that led to our InfoSec program, our security operations center. Um, and I hope some of this was useful for you. Your choices may be a little different, but uh, I'm hoping that some of the trade-offs you made, some of the choices we made, uh, and some of the architectural decisions we made in taking a platform-based approach would be relevant uh, to you as well. So we'll end over here. Thank you all for your uh, time and attendance. If you have any questions, we are available to answer any questions, or you can come by and visit our booth as well. By the way, if you're interested, uh, again, Jack runs our security operations. If you want to come and visit our headquarters in Santa Clara and get a tour of a security operations center, uh, please uh, feel free to take us up on that as well. Thank you very much. Thank you.